Merry meet. Today we will be discussing circle casting. Now, first we need to understand what the purpose of casting a circle is about. The reason we have a circle is not only to contain the energy that we're raising for our magical workings, but it also acts as a filter. This is like when we use a water filter in our sink. Uh, the filter will clean out the chemicals and minerals that will make us sick while letting through the good water. The circle we raise around our magical space does something similar. It keeps out the negative energy and all the other energies that we don't really need for our ritual or magical intent and allows for the energy we do want to come through. That would be the energy that is beneficial to our magical workings. Another way to look at this would be like when we use eye protection, when we're using power tools or woodworking to make sure that you don't get sawdust in your face while you're creating something. Or even a seat belt in the car. It's always better to be safe than to find yourself in a situation when you actually needed it but didn't use the protection. So where a lot of people wonder why do we need to even bother you making a magical circle, it's always better to be safe than sorry. The next thing that we need to understand is the type of magic that we're doing. Are we doing positive magic or is it negative magic? Is the purpose of the ritual that we're doing drawing in a specific energy or is it removing a specific energy? This is how we decide how the circle is going to be wound or how we're going to raise the circle or open the circle, however uh, way you want to say it. But the first thing that we do need to know is our directions. Regardless of what hemisphere you're in, a magical circle in most rituals will start in the east, not the north, the east. Now the reason for this is because when we think of the east, it represents dawn, that's the way the sun rises. It be it's a new day, a fresh start, new beginnings, the spring. The east is representative of the element of air, and life always begins with your first breath. Magic is the same way. You start in the east because that's where things begin. This is when we're working positive magic. Now, how you choose to work with East is up to the practitioner. There are two ways. There is the natural East and there is the symbolic East. Now, natural East means that you're going to need another tool, which is a compass and a good sense of direction. Now, if you see here on the picture that I have up on my altar, I have an altar cloth, and the colors are set up for the different elements and directions. Uh, this is for the Northern Hemisphere, so if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you're going to have to swap the North and South there, and I'll explain that here in a minute. But I have yellow for East, red for South, blue for West, green for North. Um, where I have my altar set up in my house, in, in my room where I do magic, and I use my compass because of the way that the room sits, you'll see that north is to the right. So if I want to do this with natural east, uh, natural east will be at the bottom of my altar, where and west will be at the top of the altar. Um, Again, I live in the Northern Hemisphere, so North for me represents Earth, 
and I'll get to the southern hemisphere here shortly. Now here you'll see symbolic yeast and this is how a number of people do this. This is actually how I usually set up my altar rather than doing natural yeast I'll do a symbolic yeast. Um, they simply have east to the right, west to the left, and depending on if you're in the northern or southern hemisphere, the north and south will be there at the top or bottom. And this is perfectly fine to do. It doesn't have to be the physical, natural east setup unless that's the way you really want to do it. So either way is perfectly a valid way of setting up your altar and setting up your decision of where yeast is going to be. Now when we're casting a circle, another important aspect is of what part of the world you live in, the northern hemisphere or the south, southern hemisphere. And this is why in the entrance exam class you're asked which hemisphere do you live in, north or south, because that actually has a very big impact on how you not only cast a circle, but how you call the elements when you're in ritual. Now, the northern hemisphere traditionally we go clockwise. Now that, and again, the hemisphere is separated by the invisible line known as the equator, which cuts the globe in, in half crosswise. Uh, the northern hemisphere traditionally we go clockwise when creating a circle for positive purposes. So we start with the east, which is air, the south, which is fire, the west, which is water, and the north, which is earth. And in the southern hemisphere, it again starts in the east with air, then goes north for fire, west for water, south for earth. Now the reason for this again has to do with the equator. When you're in the northern hemisphere you move south to get to the equator which is the warmer climates where the heat is and when you move north you get to the North Pole where there's a lot more hills, a lot more ice, where it's colder, where it's a lot darker. So when we look at east as air, dawn, springtime and fresh starts, south fire, noon and summer, west is water where things are a little bit cooler, it means autumn and dusk, and then north is earth where we have midnight, winter. Now in the southern hemisphere, the north and south are reversed because when you move north when you're in the southern hemisphere you're getting closer to the equator and so therefore that would be noon that would be fire that's the warmer and you move south to get to the south pole which would be earth and midnight and winter so that's why we do that So if you're in the northern hemisphere, you would start in the east and walk clockwise and go around the circle, ending back at the east spot, which would be for positive energy, pulling in a specific energy. Now, if you're wanting to push out, you're doing a banishing, you would start in the north and move back around counterclockwise back to the north, but we'll get back into that here in a little bit. And if you're in the southern hemisphere, you would start in the east and walk counterclockwise and end up back in the east spot. So if you're calling in the energy in the northern hemisphere, you start in the east, go clockwise, or if you're in the southern hemisphere, you go counterclockwise. So what I like to look at it as is you're creating a circuit and a circle like a circuit and 
all the energy needs to go all the way around to make a light bulb work. If the circuit doesn't connect properly and doesn't complete itself, then the light's not going to work. And that's how we have to look at it with doing magic. You're needing to create that complete circuit to raise the energy that you're needing. And you need to be specific about what the energy is that you're raising when you're creating your circle. Okay, so now we've talked about the reason why we create a circle and the directions we need to go. But how is the circle created? So there are many, many, many different ways to create a circle, both physically and symbolically. Uh, pretty much as many ways as your imagination can think of. So I'm going to cover a few ideas to give you a kind of starting point uh, to get your mind working in ways that you possibly could create your own magical circle when you're doing your, your own magical workings. Um, for the most part, when you cast a circle, you're going to be saying something as you do it. Uh, you'll be creating a chant or an incantation or trying to, you know, get your mind into the mindset of what it is that you're preparing to do. Your circle needs to somehow represent the magic you're pulling in. I mean, you can create a very generic circle, but the more specific you are in what you say and what you use to create it, and what you do, the more in tune it the circle is going to be and more conducive it's going to be to the magical working. Like I said before, it's like a filter. It's going to filter in the energy you need and remove the energy and keep out the energy you don't want. However, if you don't tell it what you want to bring in and what you want to keep out, then, you know, it's not really going to know. So it helps if you're being very specific in in what you're doing so you can filter through the proper energy that you need. Now, a lot of times, uh, or sometimes, people don't use an incantation or chant or whatnot, and they use creative visualization. Um, Simply just the act of creating the circle itself is very helpful in helping you focus your energy on what it is that you're doing. Um, but like I said, for the most part, usually there's going to be a chant or a statement that will be made in your ritual or magical workings that you're doing. Uh, traditionally, a circle is cast three times around. As we know, the number three is found a lot in magical workings. Uh, three represents, you know, the triple god and triple goddess. Um, so we use three, three times around a lot. Um, so it's all up to what it is that you're doing, what your personal path is, because maybe you don't use the number three in your personal path. That's totally up to you. But it, this is traditionally what is done when you create a circle. Now, this first way that I'm going to describe is great for an outdoor ritual. Um, it's very easy to make a physical circle using a staff or a walking stick or a big stick or a rake, as this picture shows. Uh, simply walking the circumference of the circle, you stand in the center and you take your tool that you're using to create it and dig it into the dirt, into the soil to create a physical uh, circle is wonderful. And this is great for a temporary circle. You're marking your space physically and for your three times around you can simply continue to walk in that circle three times over uh, usually making a statement either as you're walking or before you start your turnaround or 
when you complete a circuit, however you want to do that. Uh, it just makes the hole a little bit deeper as you do it. Now, of course, you could also make a prominent one if you have the space and ability to do so. I would love to set something like this with the fire pit in the center up in my backyard if I had the space. Um, this way, if you do your ritual outdoors, you could simply use one of the other me methods that I'm going to be mentioning on how you cast your circle. You'd have the physical space already marked out, which is great. Um, other ways is if you could, you know, if you have a huge expanse of land, plant trees in a circle so that your circle is already built, you just need to walk it. Another method of physically creating a circle, which could be done, say, if you have a concrete slab, doing it on a patio, or if you're doing it in a basement, or um, on a hardwood floor, though, I would check first before you attempt this on a hardwood floor, just so that you don't ruin the floor. <laughs> um, but you could use chalk to create a temporary circle. Uh, for the three times around, you could use one color three times around or you could use three different colors such as white, red, and black which are the traditional colors of the maiden mother and crone or three other colors which would be specific to the needs of the ritual you're doing. Big thing, know your correspondences. This is why we have such a huge uh, series on, on creating correspondences because this way you'll you'll know what matches up and what you should be using color-wise or otherwise. Now, here we have a very dramatic way of creating a physical circle. We see this done in a lot of movies and TV representations of what we witches do. Um, is this a practical way of circle casting? Uh, not really. Uh, using candles to create your circle is a wonderful thing if you can do it, um, but it isn't the smartest of ideas. First of all, it's a huge fire hazard. Um, if you have, if you're outside and stuff and you have the tiki torches around, that's great, but indoors, don't recommend it. I also don't recommend it if you're choosing to use flowy robes, um, yeah, they'll catch on fire quick, <laughs> and that's really not helpful when you're trying to do ritual. So... There's lots of hazards uh, if you have a lot of open flames. Now, alternatively, using the battery-operated candles, I know a lot of people are kind of touchy on using those. I think they're great, personally, especially if you do a lot of uh, traveling and whatnot, or if you are a student in a dorm, and you're not allowed to use open flame candles. The battery operated candles are marvelous. Um, that would be really great. But open flame candles, I don't recommend using as a circle creative tool. I just added this because a lot of people think, oh, I'll just light a bunch of candles around me. And um, yeah, that's. That, it's not a great idea. Now, if you have a group that you're casting a circle with, um, and if we ever, I, I've been wanting to do a, a retreat weekend sometime to bring all the students in from all over the country and world who are members of the school, um, I would love if we 
ever get a chance to do that, this is how I plan on doing it. And it's the holding hands method. Uh, you start with the person in the east, the leader of whoever's doing the, the ritual, and they start it by taking the hand of the person next to them going around the clockwise, and the next person takes a hand, next person takes a hand. Usually, uh, there's a chant that's said, and then the second time around, you raise your hands and squeeze the hand of the person next to you, and the third time, as above, and then you put your hands down, squeeze the hand back around the circle as below. And it's a really powerful way of connecting not only with the other participants in the ritual, but to connect to the energy that you're raising too, because you're getting that physical thing. And again, it's great if you have a group. Most students at the school are solitary practitioners, so this, you know, will be great for those who are choosing to create a coven or work with other people and do a, a group. Um, but it, it's such a neat, neat way of uh, starting out a ritual. Now you can also physically drop items around your space. This is something that uh, we've done for uh, school rituals before. Um, physically taking items that you can drop, uh, for instance here in this image I'm showing is a circle of rose petals which would be lovely for a romantic or love ritual or a hand fasting even. Um, using different colored flowers, petals, great for uh, you know any of the spring festivals that we do. Uh, anything that you can easily place down and pick back up or that can be swept up later. Uh, the big thing is that it's connected and pur purposeful to the uh, ritual that you're doing. So, again, knowing your correspondences, knowing the energy that you're wanting to raise. Uh, so, this is great. You could also, like, use yarn or string to create a physical circle, again. So, there's plenty of ideas that can be used here. Okay, so now we're going to get into more uh, figurative circle casting. Uh, this is more common than not. Our circles aren't physically there. They're envisioned rather than set in stone. Uh, as you saw with my altar setup, my altar is next to a wall. So I can't physically move past that wall when I'm casting a circle. Uh, but my circle can pass through walls. Uh, it's energy. So you can move energy past your walls. Energy is not confined by space and time. Um, it can move beyond your physical space. So a very common way of casting a circle is using the elemental method, uh, using a combination of fire and air and a combination of water and earth. So first we would cast an incense, which represents both air, the incense smoke, and fire, the flame that causes the spark for the incense to burn, um, you light the incense and allow the smoke to permeate the area. You can walk the circle, but like in cases with how my altar is set up, I can't walk past the wall. So you can wait the smoke in the direction that you're going and go around your circle that way. Uh, then with the second part, you would take a mixture of water and salt to represent water and earth elements and sprinkle that around using your fingers or you could use a small bundle of herbs like a, a little bundle of uh, lavender or flowers or whatever you want to use, whatever is specific for your ritual. And this is called spurging your space. The third time around, you would send out your energy in the direction of the circle, either by pointing your finger or using a same or a wand to direct that energy. 
Now, an asome is a dagger that is used magically to direct energy. Uh, it's not used for cutting anything. You can some people use it to carve their candles, but I don't usually recommend that. Um, there are other tools that are better suited for that, but its main purpose is to direct energy. Uh, a wand is a tool that's usually made out of wood and has a gemstone point. Sometimes they're made purely out of gemstones, um, using like a crystal. Uh, that's also used to direct energy. Uh, the asame and the wand are often used to also represent the male aspect. Uh, depending on what your path is can also depend on if you use an asame or use the wand and also what element they represent. There's always a lot of controversy on which represents fire and which represents uh, air. To me, and my personal path, and this is what makes sense to me, is that the wand represents air and the asame represents fire. And the reason that this makes sense to me because I know some people are like, well, the thame, when you swish it through the air, it sounds like air, so, you know, makes that swish sound. Well, wand does the same thing. Um, but to me, the reason why the wand represents air is because when I think of magical wands, I think that you have to usually, you have to have wisdom and understand not only the wood, but the stone that you're using, and you have to have that pure understanding and wisdom, and air is connected to wisdom. For Asame, I see fire because not only is the blade forged in fire, but an Asame is a dagger. Um, and when you think of daggers, usually you think of aggression. So that that's how I connect it. That's just me. So you whichever tool you're using you hold one of these tools in your power hand and that's the hand you write with now if you're ambidextrous congratulations you can use whichever hand you're most comfortable using um, you simply focus your energy out through the tool and project it out pointing the tool along the border of your circle um, Please note, this will not cause lasers to shoot out of your tool that you're using. It's not like in the movies. A ball of light will not shoot from your magical wand. Um, a laser will not, and lightning won't come crashing out of your thumb. Uh, unless, of course, you have a laser pointer attached to it or had chosen to repurpose a laser pointer to use as a wand then you know you got a laser shooting out of it but for the most part no it doesn't work that way now another way is to simply use creative visualization we do this a lot um, you can visualize whatever you want surrounding your area it could be blooming flowers butterflies like I have pictured here uh, pulsating light, we've done books, we've done mushrooms, we've done fairies, anything that you can imagine surrounding you. Again, really important to make sure that your visualization has something to do with the ritual that you're doing. So, again, correspondences very very important so the list goes on and on and on with all the many different things you can do to create a circle uh, when you dissolve a circle you can do whatever you did in the reverse so when you're dissolving a circle if you if it was a positive 
magical thing that you were doing and you walked clockwise and you're in the northern hemisphere or counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere, then you would walk in the reverse direction again starting in the east and moving around the circle counterclockwise, or I'm sorry, starting in the north and walking counterclockwise ending in the north in the northern hemisphere and starting in the south or walking clockwise in ending up in the south in the southern hemisphere. Um, or you can, you know, however you choose to dissolve the circle, you just do it in the reverse of how you did that. Or you can take a broom to sweep the energy out. Or you can use your thumb or wand or finger to pull the energy back into you. You can pick up the items that you dropped or erase the circle you created. However you choose to do that. And Mary Parks.